Hey everyone, Riley here with Dark Arrow. If you've been following along as we build the Dark Arrow 1 prototype, you've probably seen that recently we've been putting a lot of work into finishing up the firewall forward portion of the aircraft, which is the propeller, engine, and engine accessories. And we're trying to get all this sorted out so that we can finish installing the firewall heat shield on the aircraft, which is this piece of sheet metal that you see here. I want to tell you more about the firewall heat shield, the design and construction, and then also show you some testing where we tested to see how it would perform in the unlikely event of an engine fire. Let's get into it. First off, what is the firewall? Well, the firewall is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's a physical wall in the aircraft that prevents an engine fire from reaching the rest of the aircraft structure or reaching the occupants in the airplane. And it's a really important safety feature that gives the pilot time to recognize that there's a problem and get the airplane on the ground and get the occupants to safety. The firewall in the Dark Air One is made up of a sandwich structure. There's a couple layers to it. The hot side of the firewall, or the layer that you can see most easily from the engine compartment, is made up of a layer of titanium sheet metal. It's 16 thousandths of an inch thick. And then behind the titanium is a layer of ceramic insulation that's an eighth of an inch thick. Behind the ceramic insulation is the actual structure of the firewall, which is a honeycomb sandwich panel. It has a half inch thick aluminum honeycomb core, and then it's faced on both sides with carbon fiber skins. So as I mentioned, the honeycomb sandwich panel makes up the structure of the firewall and that's protected by a heat shield, which is made up of the ceramic insulation and the titanium layer. To better understand how we pick this combination of materials and stacking sequence, I need to give you a little bit of a lecture. So we're gonna head over to the whiteboard to check that out. I think a really good way to get a better understanding of the design and construction of the firewall in an aircraft is to look at the FAA regulations that cover firewalls in certified light aircraft, which is FAR 23.1191. I wrote a, a simplified version of that regulation on the marker board here. I'll put the actual regulation up on the screen if you want to pause the video and read through it. It's a little bit dry, so I condensed it. So there's a couple parts to it. I'll walk through each part individually and we'll take it from the top. So part A states that the engine of the aircraft must be isolated from the rest of the airframe by a firewall. This also includes anything else that might burn fuel in the aircraft, like an auxiliary power unit. An APU would also require a firewall. Part B, the firewall must stop hazardous flames, liquids, or gases from reaching the occupants in the aircraft or the rest of the airframe. I think that's pretty self-explanatory and it makes sense. Part C states that openings in the firewall must be sealed and fireproofed. So an opening in the firewall might be something like a pass-through for wires or an area where the throttle cable passes through the firewall. Those would all need to be sealed and fireproofed. Part D is reserved. I'll come back to that at the end of the video. Part E states that the firewall must be corrosion protected. You wouldn't want your firewall rusting and falling apart after a couple years, so corrosion protection is important on your firewall. In part F, the FAA defines what the definition of fireproof is and how you would show compliance with being fireproof. So to be fireproof, your firewall must be subjected to flames that are 2000 degrees Fahrenheit and your test sample would have to be 10 inches by 10 inches. That looks like this. And then your flames have to cover an area on your test sample that's five inches by five inches. So I've marked that out in red marker here. This area is five inches by five inches. So you couldn't show compliance with being fireproof by just holding a lighter up to your firewall. That wouldn't be a big enough flame. Part G states that the firewall must withstand flames for at least 15 minutes. This goes back to what I was stating earlier, which is that you're trying to buy time for the pilot to recognize that there's a problem and get the aircraft on the ground and get everyone to safety. In part H, the FAA defines a list of materials that have already been tested and shown to meet the criteria of part F, our titanium that 16 thousandths of an inch thick is on that list. There are a couple aspects of our firewall that we wanted to test and validate. So to do that, we built a test rig and subjected our firewall materials to the criteria in part F. I wanna show you the test rig now. Here's our firewall heat shield test rig. You can see the main structure of it is built up of aluminum T-slot extrusions that are all held together with brackets and bolts. The flame is gonna be generated with a propane weed burner. So we got the weed burner here and that's connected to a large 20 pound propane tank here. And then my test sample is held up by this upright frame. 
have a piece of aluminum in here right now held in place by four Clecos. We're using this section of copper to give us an indication of the temperature. Copper melts right in that 2000 degree F window, so when this piece of copper melts, we'll know that we're right at 2000 F. I got a frame or a bracket right here to support a camera so that we can observe what's going on on the hot side of the firewall. And then there's a mirror back here that allows the camera to also see what's going on on the cold side of the firewall. So with one camera, I can see both sides of the firewall. We also have an infrared camera. Uh, you'll see that during the test video. And then to record what the occupant of the aircraft might experience if they were right behind the firewall, we have a very technical, very precision measurement device, which is our Dark Arrow standardized Marshmallow Man. We're not going to fire up this test rig in the hangar or even on airport property. We did all the firewall testing at home in the driveway, so I'll show you that testing now. The first sample we're going to look at is going to be 2024 T3 aluminum, 16 thousandths of an inch thick. At this thickness, it's not really representative of anything you'd see in a light aircraft made out of aluminum, but I wanted to stay apples to apples in my comparison of all these materials, so we use 16 thou thick on everything. Aluminum is not on the approved list and you'll pretty quickly see why here. 2024 starts to soften and melt at 932F and as it continues to warm up, it's completely liquid by the time it reaches 1180F, which is well below our 2000F target we're trying to hit for our flame temperature. You can see the copper starting to warm up and glow, but before the copper melts, the aluminum is already distorting and softening and you can even see puddles of liquid aluminum melting down and dripping onto our firewall test fixture. And it's not long after you see the aluminum glowing that flames start to come through this piece of aluminum and reaching our occupant marshmallow man. This material didn't even last a minute before we had to shut the test down. Uh, it's obviously a failure, no point in running up the score, so we shut it down here. You can see that we definitely need more temperature capability out of our firewall heat shield material which leads into our next test sample, which is 304 stainless steel. Stainless is on the approved list of materials from the FAA, so we expect a much better result out of this test sample. Again, we're using a sample that's 16 thousandths of an inch thick. 304 in particular starts to melt at 2550F, which is well above our 2000F target flame temperature. So we fire up the burner, and you can see that the piece of copper that we're using to indicate temperature starts to glow, and eventually it'll melt and then the stainless steel behind it is going to start to glow as well. I did notice that the colors for these glowing pieces of metal aren't picked up quite accurately on the camera. They seem to glow a little bit brighter than they are in reality. If you look at the piece of copper, it's glowing what looks like it's almost white. In reality, it's more of a bright orange. Not that big a deal, but it's just something I wanted to point out. So you can see that glowing stainless. It's not only on the hot side where the flames are, but that continues through that thin piece of metal, so the backside is glowing as well. Flames aren't making it through, which is good, but that glowing piece of metal is going to start to become a problem because it radiates heat to whatever is on the cold side of the firewall. You can see this on the infrared camera. If you look at the little crosshairs over the Marshmallow Man, you can see he's warming up to 120, 125F, and his temperature continues to climb as the test progresses. So I'll speed up the test a little bit so you can see that. So you can see as we get further into the test, four and five minutes in, the temperature at the Marshmallow Man is to the point where this would be a problem if these were your feet sitting right behind the firewall at the rudder pedals. So you wouldn't want to use just stainless steel alone as your firewall. You need something to insulate the cold side of the firewall and protect anything behind the firewall from that radiant heat. And you can also imagine that if you had something in contact with that glowing piece of stainless steel that could potentially ignite. This is why we're incorporating the ceramic blanket on the back side of the stainless steel to insulate between the stainless steel and our honeycomb sandwich panel. I'll show you how that ceramic blanket performs next. Before I show you that, we'll take one last look at how the Marshmallow Man is reacting to the radiant heat. You can see he's definitely getting a little bit burnt up. Here's our 1 8 inch thick ceramic blanket that we're going to be using for the test. We also ran this in conjunction with a one ply piece of carbon fiber. The idea is we're trying to somewhat simulate what that half inch thick honeycomb panel would do. The sandwich panel holds the blanket up against the steel, 
but we didn't want to use the sandwich panel because we're curious as to what's going on on that cold side of the blanket. We're trying to see does enough heat come through the blanket to do anything really bad to the carbon fiber. Using one ply of carbon fiber allows us to see that. On this test, we expect similar results with the steel. It should heat up and glow, but we're looking to see less heat coming through into the cabin. There is some smoke that comes out from the blanket and you see that around the sides of the stainless steel coming out the edges. That's because there's a binder in the blanket that's there to hold the blanket together so that you can cut it and work with it. That binder burns off at a relatively low temperature, maybe 300 to 500 F. And after that binder burns off, the test runs pretty clean. It would be important to not have that smoke come into the cabin and we have means to do that on the aircraft but you can't really show that on this test. And that's one thing I don't like about this test is it doesn't really show in an accurate way smoke coming into the cockpit, but that's not really the point of this test. It's more just to show do flames and heat come into the cabin. I should mention that there are other versions of this blanket without a binder, and I wanna test some of those, but I didn't have any on hand yet. I'll speed up the test a little bit here. As the test progresses, the temps do climb at the Marshmallow Man, but they stabilize after a while. We didn't run the test for the full 15 minutes because you can get an idea pretty quickly what's gonna happen. After about five or six minutes, everything stabilizes. It's about 120 to 125 F at the Marshmallow Man, so it's pretty boring after a while. Keep in mind, there still would be a half inch thick honeycomb sandwich panel behind the blanket, and that honeycomb core traps a nice pocket of air in the panel that acts as further insulation. So we would expect even cooler temperatures in the cabin on the cold side of the firewall. As this test is right now, it's a pass. Fire doesn't come through the firewall heat shield and not too much heat gets into the cabin. So this is a working combination and it's not really a surprise because this setup is already proven and actually pretty popular in composite kit aircraft. This is what I used on my Cozy. The only issue here is that the stainless steel is a little bit heavy. For a piece of stainless large enough to make our heat shield in the Dark Arrow 1, it'd be about 3.8 pounds of material. But if we go to titanium, that number drops to 2.2 pounds. So it's about a 1.6 pound weight savings going from stainless to titanium. So that's the next test sample that we're going to look at. Again, we're using titanium that's 16 thousandths of an inch thick. But the area on this test sample is slightly different. I made all my test samples out of scrap material. And the scrap I had left over for titanium was only 9 and 5 eighths inch wide, so that's what I used, but we'll call it close enough for the purposes of this test. Titanium is on the approved list of materials from the FAA, so we know it's going to hold up to flames. It has a melting point over 3000 F, so it has excellent high temperature capability. Kind of explains why they made the SR-71 from titanium. We're going to be running this test with an 8 inch thick layer of ceramic blanket, just like we did in the last test with the stainless steel. I'll tell you right away that this is a working combination, and again, this is what we're using on the Dark Air 1 prototype. We'll speed it up so that we can get to the interesting part. The temperature on the Marshmallow Man stabilizes after a while at around 135F. This is slightly higher than it was with our stainless steel test. I think this just comes down to I had the little temperature crosshairs on my infrared camera on a little bit different location on the Marshmallow Man. I didn't really think about this until I was reviewing the footage, but I could have just used a high temperature thermocouple, put one on the firewall and then one on the Marshmallow Man, and it would have given me a more accurate reading. I'll probably do that on future tests. Maybe it seems a little silly to go to that extent. I know we're kind of having fun with this test, but it's still serious business that you need to get right. I hope everyone who watches this video comes away with a healthy respect for the importance of a proper firewall heat shield. And also I hope this video shows you what can happen if you don't have a good firewall heat shield. You can't just use anything that says high temperature, you need to use qualified materials. Maybe you're asking what's the point of this test, didn't we just validate a bunch of materials that were already proven and accepted by the FAA? Well, these weren't the only materials that we tested. We're actually working on a solution that's not on the FAA approved list that'll be lighter than the titanium, a little bit more cost effective, and easier for our builders to work with. We can't use it until we prove it out though. I'll save that for a future update. In the meantime, if you want, you can leave a comment and guess what that solution might be. A quick summary of the results of the test that we showed in this video. I know we showed a lot, so hopefully this helps to keep everything straight. The last three on this list show an endurance of greater than 15 minutes. That's more leaning on the accepted materials list from the FAA 
I know we didn't show them being tested for more than 15 minutes. I hope you enjoyed our discussion on firewall design, but before I wrap up the video, there's some unfinished business I need to take care of. If you remember back when I was talking about the regulations governing firewall design, Part D was reserved and there was nothing in there about radiant heat levels, which is what is killing our marshmallow man. So FAA, I know you're watching YouTube. I got a proposal for an addition under Part D. I think it should say that the firewall must limit radiant heat to level safe for a standard dark arrow marshmallow man. I've already got a really good start on a standard for a marshmallow man. So FAA, hit me up if you need more information on that. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next video. Part B, firewall must stop hazardous liquids, gases, or flames. <laughs>